Good news I've shared recently. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I think it's quite hard. Eva's pregnant. No. <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, my wife gave birth to my first child. I can't believe you just said that. Um, Me and my husband get closer because we spend lots of time together. Yeah. The fact that I got a job. <laughs> Probably telling my family that he got a job. <laughs> that was really. Uh, I released a single two weeks ago. Uh, it was cool, it's about mental health. I recently got my parents to become plant-based. I'm getting a scooter, so no more bike, no more pedaling. Um... Uh, I've graduated. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm not jobless, so that's a good news. I just moved to a new place, so that was like the news of my <laughs> little life, and I shared it with my friend and family. My football team coming back to the Premiership for the first time in 16 years. Shared it on WhatsApp. Have you told anyone you're doing alpha? Maybe you'd say, well, I'm not ready to tell anyone because I don't even know what I think. Or perhaps you're thinking, I've begun to experience something. But supposing someone asks you about it, what would you say? How would you explain it? And why would you even want to? And sometimes even I struggle with that. I find it difficult to tell people that I go to church and sometimes feel a bit embarrassed about sharing my faith. And I don't know why. I suppose I just worry that people think that I'm going to be a bit weird or something. And sometimes people can freak out when you talk about what you believe. But the thing is, I know in my heart what I believe. So why am I so afraid? Why is it sometimes so hard to tell others? I can remember before I was a Christian, I used to be really irritated by the Christians that I met who wanted to talk to me about their faith. It's like they were trying to convert me. I was an atheist. I wasn't trying to convert anybody to atheism. I couldn't understand why they couldn't just keep it to themselves. Sometimes people say, isn't faith just a private matter? Aren't the best kind of Christians the ones who live out their faith but don't talk about it? And everyone seems to have a kind of Uncle Norman, this perfect Christian who lives it out but doesn't talk about his faith. But the question I want to ask is, how did Uncle Norman become a Christian? Someone must have told him. And if the early Christians hadn't talked about their faith, we would never have heard. So why should we tell people about Jesus? First of all, because Jesus told us to. The word go appears in the Bible 1,514 times. Jesus was constantly saying to his disciples, go and tell, go and invite, go and make disciples. He's saying, I've come that you might have life and life in all its fullness. Go and tell people the good news about me. And then there's the need of other people out there. It's, a, it's an act of love to tell people this amazing news that Jesus brings us peace, a, a deep inner joy, fills our hearts with love, brings meaning and purpose to our lives, brings forgiveness, eternal life. I mean, this is amazing. It's like if you found water in a desert, an oasis. It would be really selfish just to take the water and drink it yourself and not tell your friends. You want to tell your friend, look, we found water. And it's natural to want to tell people, we found Jesus. And then it's such good news. The word gospel literally means good news. And when you hear good news, you want to tell other people. Good news travels fast. I think that was your, uh, your job was to call, call people once Henry was born. And, and I'd given you a list of all the people that you had to call. I think you gave me a list of 10 people, didn't you? No, I probably just put it on Facebook. It was back in the old days where you had call boxes and you had to put in money, 10 pieces. Yeah. Um, make the calls. So it's a bit more complicated. So I went off to, the, uh, to make the, the calls and I, the first person I rang was 
Pippa's mother. I rang her and I said, it's good news, we've had a son. He weighs whatever, 12 pounds, six ounces. Seven, nine. Uh, whatever it was. Um, and then um, second person on the list was my mother. Mm -hmm. So I rang my mother, she was engaged. So then I went to, the next person was Pip's sister. And she said, oh, I've heard, you've had a son. Um, and you, you know, Henry, and I thought, that's strange. And she said, my mother's just rung me. And I went to the next one, and they said, oh, you know, congratulations, I hear you've had a son. And I went down the list. They literally, they, 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 someone had rung someone. So all the following calls, they'd already heard. And when I eventually got through to my mum, she said that um, she'd already heard from Pippa's mother. So Pippa's mother had rung her, that's why she'd been engaged. I didn't need to say to Pippa's mother, you must tell people. It was quite natural for her. It, it, good news travels fast. When you hear good news, you want to tell people. And she had told people. When I encountered Jesus, I wanted to tell people. That was, it was the most natural thing, I guess, is to want to tell people. But the way I went about it was not always very sensitive. And I remember I, very soon after I encountered Jesus, I went to a party and I was determined to tell the first person that I knew, met there, that I knew about Jesus. And it so happened that the first person I saw who I knew was Pippa, who was on the dance floor. So I thought, right, I'm going to go and tell her about Jesus. And during the time, the 10 days that I've been a Christian, I've been to a talk on evangelism. And they said, if you want to tell people about Jesus, the first thing you need to do is establish the fact that the person needs Jesus. So I thought, right, I've got to go and establish the fact she needs Jesus. So I went straight up to her on the dance floor. I didn't want to waste any time with polite conversation. I just said, hello, Pippa, you look terrible. You really need Jesus. <laughs> so that was insensitivity. And I think, you know, if you go around like that, sooner or later you get hurt. And I swung from insensitivity to fear. I became very fearful even to talk, mention the name Jesus. And I guess that's a lot of my life. I was looking for ways in which to communicate faith in a way that doesn't involve either insensitivity or fear. We need to realize that telling others about Jesus arises naturally out of our own relationship with God. And ultimately our motivation is love. Love for God and love for other people. And one way we can tell people about it without insensitivity is by our presence in the world. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. My sister was about to get married, so she was doing this marriage preparation course at, at church. And she said, Julia, you know, do you want to come along to church one Sunday? I'm going anyway. And I kind of wrestled with, with my faith and I was looking for answers and just was looking for those in the wrong places. And I thought, well, you know what, I'll go to church. And somebody prayed for me and I just felt this real peace, like I'd, I'd sort of come home and it just so happened that Alpha was kind of starting the following Wednesday. So I went on Alpha and it wasn't a fast sort of journey, but just just a, just a strong week by week building, a, a rebuilding of my faith really. And I think everything that I knew of God to be true kind of dropped from my head to my heart. A few years ago, I heard a talk all about human trafficking and I knew nothing about it. Didn't think that the buying and selling of human beings actually existed. And I just felt instantly this sort of horror that why didn't I know as an educated girl? Why did I not know about this? And so I, I really sort of said to God, okay, how can I serve you in this? How can I make a difference? Long story, but I ended up putting together a crew and we wanted to be the fastest women ever to row the Atlantic Ocean, to retrace the transatlantic slave trade route and really 
try and make a noise and be a voice for so many people who don't have that voice today. We left in a race um, amongst 17 other crews. We were the only all-female crew and we set off um, in 50-foot high waves the size of houses. Um, had I known what was coming, I think we'd have all run a mile. Um, we had the most horrific seasickness. We lost about a third of our food. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. Everything that could break broke. Um, just the physical exertion of rowing 12 hours a day, uh, two hours on, two hours off. It was really tough, but actually the mental battle of 3,000 miles was so overwhelming. And I think had I not had something to row for, I think I'd have given up. This isn't just a, you know, something, a row that I did. It's, it is an absolute life's work that I'm committed to and it's, a, it's definitely a marathon and not a sprint and there's highs, there's lows. I'm often reminded of William Wilberforce, a real hero of mine, who for 45 years didn't give up. He kept persevering after so many setbacks and so many challenges until three days before he died. Only then did the abolition of the slave trade bill get passed through Parliament and it was such a victory and so many times when I, I think about how overwhelmed I felt. I just, I just think of that fortitude and that resilience that he had and that we can learn and take so much from his example. And I feel like I grasped a little bit of that on, on those weeks on the ocean. And off the back of the row, um, we've founded Sport for Freedom, our charity, which now we help directly rehabilitate survivors of human trafficking in the UK. So to be able to really um, make a difference in people's lives um, through what we did and the story just keeps keeps being told can't all do everything but look what can we all do let's all do our somethings and so all our somethings collectively make a difference Nelson Mandela said, it's not the kings and generals who make history, but the masses of the people. Jesus calls us to have a wide ranging influence. And to do that, we need to be out there in the world and not withdrawn from it. Yeah, Jesus says that we should be like salt and light. The salt, of course, gives flavor. But in the ancient world, it was a preservative. It stopped meat from going bad. And as Christians, we're called to stop society from going bad. Jesus says, you are light. We're a light in the world by our good deeds, by everything we do as Christians, how you respond to hunger and homelessness and poverty and injustice in the world. Martin Luther King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And we're called to be out there in the workplace, in our community, being salt and light, showing little acts of kindness towards others. How we live speaks volumes. My name's Hugo Monnier. I'm a former rugby player. Um, I used to play for a team called Harlequins in London, um, played for England and the British and Irish Lions. I'm now a commentator slash pundit, so I've gone from playing rugby to talking about it, which is great. Whether it be socialising, making new friends, going into a new job, became a professional rugby player. Um, I guess I, I thought I was a bit too cool to go to church. It wasn't so much a priority in my life, put it on the back burner and kind of became infatuated and other things took the role of God in my life. That's kind of how it was for me. But then kind of moving into rugby, that, that changed a little bit. It became more of a focal point when I just started to find my feet a little bit. Um, it's funny, before every game, people talk about rituals and some guys, they put the right sock on first or they're out of the changing room last. But for me, within rugby, the one thing I always had to do was get on the phone and say a prayer before I went out onto the rugby pitch. For me, that moment, was more important than any of the training I had done. We had a huge game against uh, London Wasps. Um, they're a big rival, huge game for us. And uh, written this message under my top. And I uh, scored one of the best tries I ever scored for Harlequins, my, my team. And uh, scored this try, lifted up my top, showing this message which says, uh, thank you, Jesus. No one saw the message apart from the people who were in front of me, which were in the crowd. None of my teammates have seen it. Not until about Tuesday, Wednesday, where some pictures came out in the press and it came out on the internet and they were like, Hugo, what the heck was that? 
didn't, didn't get it. They would, some, some guys were a bit concerned. They're like, is everything okay in your life? I mean, why do you need Jesus? I mean, what, what does that mean? I mean, like, are you part of a cult now? And asking all these kind of weird questions, but I was so glad that it became a topic and it was really cool. And then you could start talking to them about, you know, the reasons why you did it and why I felt. And for me, this has been my best news and I want the world to know about it. For me, it's just having conversations. It's not knocking on the door too hard, but it's just telling people about your good news. I love going to church. I love my God because of this is what he's done for me. If you want a part of it, whatever it is, but it's just having decent conversation. If people can trust and they see the authenticity in you, then they may want a piece of it too. I, I now commentate, I talk about rugby. And when I do my commentary, the one thing I know I've got to do is be excited about it because I'm talking to people at home. And if I can't be excited about rugby, how can I expect people at home to be? And the same is with, same is with the Christian faith. If when I'm talking about my Christian faith, if I'm like, what's it like? Yeah, well, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not bad, you know. Um, you know, they do good cups of tea and uh, the message is normally pretty good. No one's coming to church, but if I'm genuinely excited about it, then, then they're going to get excited. They may want to understand, they may want to get it for them. And uh, yeah, be authentic about it. Be honest, tell them about your experiences. Don't judge anyone. And if you're excited about it, show them that you're excited. Being a light in the world doesn't just involve our lifestyle, but it also involves our words, what we say. And our family and our friends and our colleagues at some point might ask us questions about our faith. So when we get the opportunity to talk about our faith, how do we go about it? Well, the Apostle Paul went to Thessalonica and it says that he reasoned, he explained, he proved from the scriptures that the Christ had to suffer and rise again. And some of the Jews were persuaded. We don't always know how to answer people's questions, but we can often find out the answers or point them in the right direction. There's a difference between persuasion and pressure. Now, some people will run a mile if they feel pressurised to do something. But the effect of pressure is the opposite to that of persuasion. Paul said, we try and persuade people. This is because it's such good news. And persuasion is what the early Christians used to explain the reason for their faith. The Apostle Peter says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you about the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. And as well as being prepared to give an answer, we need to be prepared to listen to people, to understand where they're coming from, and to respect their opinions and their values. The heart of telling others is the proclamation of the good news about Jesus. It's communicating to people about Jesus, and that's what we're trying to do here on Alpha. There's an almost infinite variety of ways, of course, in which you could do that, and lots of different ways in the New Testament. One of the ways is simply to say, come and see. That's what Jesus said. He said to people, come and see. And they came and saw, and then they went out and told their friends, come and see. And this is probably one of the reasons that many of you are here today a friend or a member of your family or a work colleague said to you, come and see. And this is something all of us can do. Albert McMakin was a farmer. When he was 24 years old, Albert came to faith in Jesus at a church service in a nearby town. He was so full of excitement and passion that he filled a truck with friends and took them to the next service to hear the gospel as he had. There was a farmer's teenage son who Albert was especially keen to get to the service, but the young man was hard to persuade. He was much too busy falling in and out of love with different girls, so it's safe to say that he wasn't particularly attracted to Christianity. But Albert Mamekin had an idea, and he managed to persuade the young guy to come to church by asking him to drive the truck. When they arrived, Albert's guests decided to go in and was, in his own words, spellbound. He went back again and again until one night he went to the front of the meeting to pray and gave his life to Jesus Christ. The year was 1934. Since that day, Albert's guest has spoken in person to over 210 million people about the Christian faith, more than anyone else in human history. He has become the friend and confidant of 10 American presidents and has spoken about Jesus to almost half the world's population by radio and TV. 
The man's name is Billy Graham. We can't all be like Billy Graham, but we can be like Albert McMakin and we can bring our friends to Jesus. And one of the most powerful ways of communicating the gospel is to share our own story. And that's what the Apostle Paul did. He shared his own story over and over again. He said, this is how I was, then I met Jesus, and this is how I am now. When a blind man was healed by Jesus, many people came to question him about it, including the Pharisees who cross-examined him and tried to trap him. The blind man didn't know how to answer their questions. So he said, one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. It's hard to argue with that. People can argue about the claims of Christianity, but they can't argue with your story. In the New Testament, the proclamation of the gospel is often accompanied by a demonstration of the power of God. The Apostle Paul wrote, our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. This is not just about words or intellectual arguments. It's about the experience of the Holy Spirit. And this was certainly true for me when I first encountered the power of the Holy Spirit. I experienced what Paul speaks of in Romans 5.5. He says, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Ultimately, we can't change people's hearts, only God can. So prayer is essential when it comes to telling others. St Paul in his letter to the Romans writes, my heart's desire and prayer to God is that they may be saved. And many people find that when they come to faith in Christ, there's been somebody praying for them, maybe a member of their family or a godparent or a friend. So the greatest thing that you can do is to pray for your family, for your friends and colleagues and keep it going. Now, over the course of a lifetime, we can trust that God will be at work in their lives. My family was always super, um, like, protective. So when I moved to Vancouver, I was introduced to, and studying university, I was introduced to um, alcohol and cigarettes and parties and clubbing. I love people and I love having friends and they noticed this and so what they did was they asked me if they just pretty much hired me to bring people into the clubs and then I'll bring I don't know anywhere between 20 to 100 people on the weekends but I was super passionate about it because I was life for me I love the club I love feeling like I was part of a community my dad actually started going through um, really, really bad depression. He went through several um, times where he wanted to actually commit suicide. Somebody that knew him said, hey Jorge, like I know that you're going through all of this and, and I really, I don't know if this will be of help at all, but there's this thing called the Alpha Course and why don't you just give it a try? And my dad had never been to church before, but somehow he actually took that invitation and said yes. He gave his life to Christ. I remember this moment like it was yesterday. He sat at our table and he said, listen you guys, I just wanna to talk to you. I have received forgiveness from God and I would actually love to ask for forgiveness from you. And he asked my mom for forgiveness and um, he moved back to our home that day. And he was completely transformed. He was a different person, full of light. My dad actually said, Dory, I really want you to try going to church. And actually it was uh, one Monday night, I was, uh, I was invited to the Alpha Course and I was in the back because I was very skeptical. And for the first time I was like, oh, I wonder what it would be like if I lifted my hands to God and said, I love you for the first time. And, and so I was like, well, nobody's looking, so I can do it. And I lifted my hands to God and I said, God, I love you, I need you. And right away, so I just felt the love of God from a go from my head to my toes, all over. And I just felt that I was loved for the first time in my life. The week after I encountered God, I was like, why didn't anybody tell me about this? And why am I not telling other people about this? I have to. So I remember I went into my office and I 
started inviting everybody. Like I was like, you have to, you have to come to church. And uh, my, my brother is younger than me, so I, I said like, Jorge, you just need to try it. You need to come. And uh, he came and. He was touched by God, and he was completely transformed by the love of God. And then later, um, that same year, my mom came, and she was also completely transformed by God. And then after that, my parents went to Miami to see my grandparents, and there, they took my grandparents to a church, and they gave them their life to Christ, and all because of one invitation. I find it in my passion, like before I used to love um, clubs and I, I, I really genuinely thought that it was a good way for people to meet other people and, and to have community so I was excited about it and of course I was like how could you not come like you love it there and that's where I find my passion now that God has transformed my life because somebody invited my dad um, to a relationship with God I am now completely transformed so why wouldn't I invite somebody else? So we pray for others, but we also pray for ourselves. You may face opposition. You probably won't face physical persecution as many people around the world today face and the early Christians faced. But people may laugh at you, people may ridicule you. The early Christians, when they faced real opposition of physical persecution, they prayed for boldness. And I want to encourage you not to give up. The message of Jesus is so important. Keep on telling people. I heard about a man in World War II who was dying in the trenches. And his friend came over to him and said, is there anything I can do for you? And the man said, no, there's nothing you can do for me. I know I'm dying. And so the friend said, well, is there any message I can take when I get back to England? And the man said, yes, please take this message to this man at this address. And this is the message. He said, tell him that what he taught me as a child is helping me in my dying moments. So when the friend got back to England, he went to that man at that address and he told him that what he taught that soldier as a child helped that man to die. And the man said, God forgive me, he said. I gave up teaching Sunday school years ago because I thought that what I was doing was having no effect. Whenever you tell people about Jesus, it has an effect because the gospel is the power of God. Sometimes maybe you'll get discouraged. Sometimes I've been discouraged. You think people are not really interested, but you never know what's really happening in people's lives. If you've experienced Jesus yourself, keep on telling people. If you do, you will have this extraordinary privilege of seeing other people discover faith. I can't think of anything that makes a greater difference to a person's life than if they encounter Jesus Christ.